<laughs> I am so delighted dang. that this is happening right now. I don't even need to do anything. He's just hey, he's just gonna throw a boomerang to himself. I don't have I'm gonna to go do get it before anything. I forget. You got a mural made about you. Well, I wouldn't say it's about me, but it does feature me in a way, uh, in, a, in, a, in a crazy way. So, so the story behind this one, Brian, um, is uh, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, Darian Fleming, uh, contacted me out of the blue, and he said, "Hey, uh, are you friends with the Another Round guys?" And of course I am. So I said, "Yeah, I just actually got off the phone with them." He said, "Well, I, was, I had this crazy idea." Um, Darian is a mural artist, obviously, and he wanted to do disc golf art to kind of just bring art to the city of Charlotte, which he already has art all over the city, but he wanted to bring disc golf art to the city. He said, Charlotte needs that. And what better place than the side of another round? And so he had me be a liaison to get a hold of Joe and the crew, and then they started working on it. And uh, Darian was gracious enough to offer this beautiful piece pro bono. I, I don't know how, cause it's like his job and this took months. Um, but yeah, he he put wow. a lot of thought and time into this. And um, he initially asked me if I felt okay with using my face and likeness. And I told him absolutely not. Like Charlotte Disc Golf is way, way bigger than anything that yeah. I've ever done. People that brought the courses here and managed the club and run tournaments and done all the hard work to make sure the courses are beautiful and make Charlotte what it is. They deserve all the praise and stuff like that. And so we initially, or he initially ditched the, the OG idea, which was, I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And then they had some other concepts and they've ran a couple ideas before they eventually landed on Yuli's backhand and my forehand. It came back to me somehow. And um, I was okay with it as long as it wasn't my face because I didn't want yeah. that representation. Yeah, he felt like uh, Yuli and I had, had done a lot to bring awareness to Charlotte and put a Charlotte on the map in some ways because of our content we've done with Jonas. And I thought that was really kind of him to say that. And so this is what the, the beautiful final piece looks like. This is, it was all spray paint? Yeah, it blows my mind. You get up close and the details are more impressive the closer you get. Well, sh well show me. Like, as an artist, what about this is like the most impressive thing to you? Well, <laughs> the lines are so good. And the blending is just beautiful. Look at the shirt, like look at the wrinkles in yeah. the shirt. Yeah. Look at the belt. Darian's the man. This he's, is like one of the coolest so murals that I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable because it, another round needs no introduction to anyone because they've really established themselves as one of the stores. It's now becoming a chain. There's, I think, three of them now, and there's gonna be more, I'm sure, over time. And this store has got a lot of popularity, but bringing art to the side of it and really like putting disc golf art in Charlotte is just, it's, it's beautiful. I know how much you love it here, and I know that there's so much history here for you, even outside of disc golf. I want you to take me to a park. Oh, yeah. I want you to play Frisbee with me. Oh, please. And I want you to tell me some more stories about you and Charlotte. Is that, okay? Is that okay? It would be an honor, Brian. Let's go throw some frisbee, man. <laughs> what a blessing. Yeah. I knew this was gonna happen. Every time I play catch with Germ, it's not just like, a, oh yeah, this is a cool disc, let's throw it. You get the pro shot. All of these have stories, all of these have like history to them. Like he has such a cooler collection than I have. So I'm gonna share some stuff with him, but I have a feeling we're gonna hear all about a lot of discs today. We're, we're, we're filming? <laughs> have been. <laughs> so. How perfect. You had a stint of ultimate in your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, very illustrious two tournament career. Yep. But, yeah. you, but you called yourself an ultimate player. You played, yeah, you played I ultimate. mean, I was I was into the culture. I, I I brought an ultimate. I brought two frisbees with me, and maybe one textbook in my backpack. Well, we're gonna throw the ultimate disc that came before yeah, the dude. ultimate disc. This oh my is gosh. a Whammo 80 mold in the uh, high durability experimental plastic, the HDX plastic. These were ran, I believe, from 1977 to 83, wow. and this is Whammo's. Uh, Attempts to make a scratch resistant plastic. Okay. And this is what was like the gold standard of Ultimate. It's only 165. Okay. So when the Ultra Star came along to be the standard, that people like the lower profile, they like the 175. Yeah. And then all the other iterations in the future, 
like the 81 or 82 molds, they just, they kind of went by the wayside. This is like the last frontier of like ultimate disc that Whammo made. That is so cool. Yeah. Well, white Carolina blue is my color, man. So that this is perfect. I didn't know you only played two tournaments of ultimate. Yeah, so um, it was basically a, a thing where, uh, so I played for App State, the, the Nomads, and um, they had a team of really dedicated disc golf, or for, uh, sorry, ultimate frisbee players. And they were meeting for practice about uh, two, four nights a week, two hours at practice. And I had other interests. Like I played a lot of basketball in college and I still had aspirations of, of taking my basketball like career somewhere and playing university level basketball. And so like I couldn't really commit myself to as much ultimate as far as the practices go to really warrant any playing time in tournaments. Yeah. And uh, I'd, I'd show up and I was the deep, deep threat because I was pretty athletic and I, I could run fast and I could jump high. And so I was, a, I was definitely a threat in the tournaments, but I never traveled for the team. I just played in the local tournaments oh. that came by. And so that's why, I mean, I don't really have much of an in-depth uh, tournament record, but, uh, <laughs> oh, but I, uh, I definitely hung out with the team a lot. You know, like I partied with them mm -hmm. and they were my guys, um, but yeah, didn't play many tournaments. Just really loved ultimate frisbee, though. That just blew. That just blew me away. I I thought because of how good you were at throwing traditional frisbee, <laughs> I thought you were just like ultimate guy forever. I was a freak. I was a freak, Brian. It went everywhere with me. I played catch every day, like every single day. I would just be waiting for somebody that I recognize in any of the quads, like. Hey, let's go. And I just sometimes I even just throw the frisbee at them and just hope that it would pique their interest. That's actually kind of creepy because I did the exact same thing. And I would look through the syllabus of my courses <laughs> yes. Yes. and I would say, how many can I miss? And I would keep an ultra star <laughs> uh, in my in my backpack. And if I saw one of my teammates or I saw other people playing on the quad, done. Yeah. Class is over. Totally, yeah, class is over, man. I I mean I was the same with the ping pong balls. Like if I if I heard someone playing ping pong in the in the, uh, in the middle of the dorm, I was gone. It was no question. Like I, I had zero focus. Like I was in school for one reason, to have a good time. And not party, but just have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> and so that eventually led to me being like, hey, we're gonna usher you out of this institution because you're not here for the right reason. Oh, they ushered you out. Yeah, well, they were just kind about it. They're like, hey, yeah, you're not going to class. Uh, and your grade point average is reflecting that. Uh, so we're not gonna allow you to go to class anymore, so you won't have to worry about missing classes anymore. So, so hang on, so there's a gap here that I don't understand. Yes. When did you get good at throwing traditional Frisbee? Like, did, did Ultimate okay. start that? All right, so I let's go to the beginning then, Brian. Um, I grew up in a hippie household, right? And so when I was a wee lad, this Frisbee, which we throw this way, quickly becomes a plate. So when you go to rainbow gatherings and you're hanging out with hippies and you're in, the, in the, the national forest and whatnot and there's kitchens that are serving different meals in different places, you gotta bring a plate with you. Well, you have entertainment and a dinner plate all in one with the Frisbee. So I grew up in, a, in an atmosphere where the Frisbee was, was a, a craft. It, was, it actually had other meanings than just a flying object. Yeah. But when I wasn't throwing, I was sitting there watching the adults play. And Frisbee culture in the 80s and the early 90s when I was growing up was huge, right? And so this was like how people communicated. And so there was these big circles of 20 adults playing catch. And there I am as a kid watching this being like, hey, me too, me too. This was a cool thing for me. So I grew up loving the idea of flight and just not being like, couldn't wait until I could actually do it myself. And I remember, I do remember having a mean little thumber forehand. That's how I you can't start really throwing. Do it anymore, but like when I was a kid, that's how I got the zip on it. Wow. <laughs> this thing flies great, man. The it's kind of windy out here. Did, so like, did you have like mentors that would teach you how to throw? Oh God, no. What? I don't. I mean, my mom was had a short stint with this guy named David Alexander English, who now paints uh, in Venice Beach. That's what his job is. He he lives out of his VW bus, and he and he paints uh, sacred geometry. <laughs> Okay. And he was the first person that I really remember having a, a proper uh, catch sesh with. And that was in like 1993. And wow. so I was like seven or eight at the time. And that was when um, I really played catch with somebody who, who had like, I'll give him credit and say he had freestyle skills, but he just knew how to do like cool shots, you know, like he could do different things other than just like stand and deliver. Yeah. And that was when the artistic, like how you could throw these things was kind of introduced to me. That being said, 
I didn't pick up disc golf or actual like proper Frisbee or ultimate until I was 18 years old as a senior in Myers Park High School and I played for the club team in, in high school. Oh. And I took that Frisbee love with me to college, but that's really it, man. When I got out of school my sophomore year uh, of college, I came to Charlotte, I had no idea what disc golf was, and I found out that Charlotte was a, a bit of a mecca, and then I, I started playing disc golf. And, and it just, it brought back all of that childhood love for, for flight, for catch, and, and it just gave me something to do because school was out. Yeah. You know, I didn't have school anymore, so like, what's next? And this disc golf thing just became it. <laughs> We've been friends for a little bit. I thought me introducing this like OG like ultimate disc would fl like bring back these flooding ultimate memories. But you played two tournaments. Two tournaments. I totally didn't realize that. Yeah, I, didn't I don't think that I really was ever your, like your gave you that that detailed description before. Like my yeah, it's I say I played ultimate because I did. Yeah. But I wasn't like you I wasn't an traveling guy. around, man. I had my interests were spread out. Yeah. They were spread out, and I just I couldn't I couldn't dedicate the time in college because I was so dedicated to my schoolwork, you know? Yeah. Oh wait, that's not it. Basketball, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, oh wait, table tennis. <laughs> or just hanging out and doing whatever the thing that wasn't focused on what I should be doing. <laughs> that's why I didn't have time for, this, for Ultimate. You have a gift for me? I have a gift for you because I think, I think there's not many people that can truly appreciate this in the way that I think you can. And this is before X Plastic. This is before any other stuff. This is oh no OG Comet. This is this is when are you serious? This is when discs were just discs. They didn't have a plastic name or anything like that. This is like I don't know if it has a year. 1996. Stamp, 1996 Comet. So this is 1996 D Glow. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. Oh my so God, dude! You're, thank you're, you so I much, think man. Of you, I think of you as floaty control finesse game, and that disc literally exudes floaty. Finesse. Dude, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, man. When you talked about the idea for running the show called Catch With Me, you talked about it a long time ago. I just was like, you're running, you, you said, hey, let's get like a, a disc that's special to you, like a, a unique one-off frisbee yeah. or something that might be unique. I'm like, bro, I've got so many. I've got like, <laughs> like, you want to play Catch With Wendy's, bro? You want to play Catch With Wendy's hamburgers or like SpongeBob? <laughs> Obviously those are silly, but like there's stuff that's kind of cool and unique here. Like this Nike frisbee that's made with a Whammo FB15. And it's actually made with uh, recycled shoe rubber. Like this is stuff that you don't see out there. Like this is kind of random stuff. Put that on the ground. Put that next to the other stuff. That's so sick. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to play catch with that at some point. But like I got this set of three um, that all fit in one another. This is the 1980 North American Flying Disc Series, and they all stack inside one another, which I think is just terrific. Um, I knew this was gonna happen. I, I knew this segment <laughs> was gonna was gonna. Play you ever out had like high this. C before? Yeah. I have two. This is a 1979 World Frisbee Championships disc. One of my Sponsored favorite stamps. Sponsored by High C. One of my favorite stamps ever. I love the stamp. This this was one of those like I one day will have this disc when I saw it online, and now one, that is this day. <laughs> now that this is a day that I have that disc. You know about this original regular frisbee, still in the package, never taken out. I'm not playing catch with that today, so don't even <laughs> don't even think about it. Um, Anyways, it's just old collectible stuff, but I think one of the more more unique discs I have in my collection is this golf disc, the 44 mold. This was apparently made by Victor Malafronte, PDJ number 002, and I was told there's not there's no more than like 40 of these in the world. So this right here is very special. I have no recollection how I acquired this disc. Again, we're not playing for, not playing catch with that one today, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, just the old Midnight Flyer and the old Discraft Sky Oh my Street. gosh, dude. Don't put your thumb through that. You might break it. If we're playing catch, you know what, man? There is nothing better, I think, than a good old Makani. I think this is one of the best catch discs released in a long time. It's just the lightweight okay. Zephyr mold. But you know what? I also want to throw this Nike rubber. So like, you want to go two? Yeah, let's throw a couple. What do you say? Th this is what I expected playing catch with I you. I know. I'm... This is this is why I'm not in college still. Let's go. Oh boy. Well, let's come back to me. That is the glidiest rubber I've ever seen. Holy moly. Let's come back to me again. <laughs> Tailwind's gonna help that thing fly nice. What are you doing? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> <Jeremy>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think two discs might be too much. Might be too much. Let's see if we get a little floaty glidey. So wait, this is like Nike shoes? Nike shoes, bro. That might be one of your old Nike shoes. Where did you get this? Dude, I don't know where I got any of this stuff. What? I mean, some of that stuff has memories based on who I acquired it from. And some of it is just the cool stuff of the story behind it as like where it comes from, not necessarily the person, but you know, I don't know. Are you a history guy in general? You like? I don't think I ever cared about history until I got older. And then I started really caring about history. And I think that maybe one of the things that got me interested in how things are all interconnected was through Frisbee. I wanted to know everything about every person that had anything to do with why we were where we were. Yeah. So then tell, talk to me about Charlotte Disc Golf. Like what, what do you know about Charlotte Disc Golf? And like- Sure. Our first course was Reedy Creek. I believe it went in the ground in 1989. And that was the first permanent course, I should say. The original course is Latta Park, and that's, oh boy, that's over in the Dilworth neighborhood, and it's a very popular walking neighborhood that has like steep embankments on either side, so you kind of were going through this little tunnel, and uh, it's actually a park that I used to play a lot of basketball in my high school days. And anyhow, um, the parks had an agreement, the parks had an agreement with the disc golf club that they could use Latta Park as a temporary course, and it was actually used at the World Championships in 1984, I believe. Nice. Oh. Um, but th they could use Lada Park as a disc golf course until they had a permanent course. So once Reedy Creek went in, then Lada Park got taken out. Then in uh, 92 or 91, Kilbourne Park went in, that was the second disc golf course. And then from there on, uh, I believe, you know, like as far as Charlotte is concerned, um, like Hornets Nest and Renaissance went in like 96, 97. And there was some other courses that came in right before then. Uh, but that was like really when disc golf was really establishing itself uh, in Charlotte as like, wow, these courses here are different. And for a long time, the, the, um, the well-known thing about Charlotte is we had the courses. That was smooth, bro. We had the courses, but we didn't have the players because Raleigh had all the players. Oh, really? Justin Jernigan, Jack Schmalfeld, Walt Haney, Larry Leonard, uh, Brian Schweberger, like those guys. They had the talent, we had the courses. And, uh, you know, we eventually, we didn't like that so much because we wanted the courses and the players. And I think that now we've got like five or six guys from Charlotte on tour. And uh, we've definitely solidified ourselves as, as having a lot of talent down here. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think like Charlotte is just churning out so many good players if it's so wooded and so many of the courses on tour yeah. are so long? You know, I, I think it's just because the courses themselves are engaging. And the, it doesn't necessarily have to be a shot that you throw on tour. If disc golf is fun and you're drawn into it yeah. and you have a connection with the sport and you just fall in love with it, yeah. I think that'll take you to other places. And that's what it did for me. And I think it's the, what it's done for a lot of other players from this area is that it's it's got us hooked. We're in love with this thing. And we want to know more about it. And so we go and play all these, all these other places and then we learn how to throw downhill shots. We learn how to throw over the water. We learn how to throw big open shots and stuff like that. So that's what it did for me. Um, but on top of that, Charlotte's hosted several world championships. We hosted uh, the 1997 world championships. Ken Climo won that one. Stan McDaniel, the guy that's responsible for most of the course design from here, uh, won Masters that year, uh, one of three Masters World titles that he's won. Um, and oh. that's smooth again, sick. Yeah, so then we hosted the Pro World Championships. It was actually Pro-Am, first tournament ever to host over a thousand people in 2012. That was where Paul McBeth won his first world title. Um, and that's where Sarah Hokum won her uh, first world title, or her only world title. And um, then the Amateur Worlds in 2018. So we've, we've hosted a lot of worlds, but also just a, a ton of events down here. And I think it was, it was nice when another round came around and really solidified an actual like big presence disc golf store. Not that Charlotte like didn't have the big presence nationally, but like yeah. them coming up also, I thought, I thought was a pretty cool thing. Um, especially with their uh, social media presence and the entertainment that Joe brings with all the aces and all that. I think it's just Charlotte's just a well-oiled machine for disc golf. Like, I haven't even, look, dude, 
I've been playing disc golf for 17 years. I haven't even played all the courses in Charlotte. Yeah, I know, yeah. I haven't even played all the courses in my hometown. Because <laughs> there's so many of them, and it's just like, it, it's hard to keep up with because there's courses going in all the time. Like this one, Veterans Park. This used to be a little six-holer. I think it might have been a nine-holer at one point, but when I started playing, I think it just had six holes left. Wow, that was sick. Yes, that was sick. <laughs> that was so cool. That was so good. Sorry, I like spaced out. No, dude, I saying. mean, I, I, I got spaced out, bro. <laughs> that was nasty. <laughs> wow, that was cool. <laughs> that was so many. <laughs> I haven't get even that? done any cool shots. I'm just like watching you do all the cool stuff. This is sick. <laughs> but this, oh, was like a, this was a course where, where I would come, um, because it was actually pretty close to where I was living at the time, to just get some night practice. Because down at the bottom of the hill there, there was a basket right by the road, and there was a street light. So I could actually get disc golf. When all the disc golf was done, I would drive to the side of the street here and I'd putt at night. Sick. And you know, I, I was just a freak. And that wasn't like a common thing at that time. Yeah. I think people probably do that a lot, but this is before I had a basket and I, and I just couldn't get enough of it. I got one more disc that I want to introduce to you. I have one more surprise. Bring it, let's go. And we'll, and we'll wrap this, ba this baby up. <laughs> all right, let's do it. First off, thank you so much for the comment. Yeah, I, I of like course, it. man. It is like the one golf disc that I will like collect. We talk so much about like playing catch, playing with just like toy Frisbees uh -huh. and, and playing golf for fun. Like you talk about all these fun things that you've been doing, but then stuff got serious for you. Like you started to have success. You committed your whole life to the game mm -hmm. and then you got like a job as a disc golfer. Yes, I did. To segue into this conversation, cause I want to get into like the seriousness side of the game. Okay. I have one last disc, which is not that serious, but it's a really cool disc. This was gifted <laughs> to me by uh, Arthur Coddington from California. Oh, cool. Uh, he comes to OTB every year. He's a Hall of Fame freestyler. Oh, He's just sweet. an incredible steward of Frisbee and disc golf and just is so supportive of the community. This, to my knowledge, this Whammo 160 gram freestyle disc was the final Tour Series disc stamped on a catch disc. This was like the oh. last ever catch disc that was made as a tour series. So this is a oh, triple wow. tour series disc. Arthur and his two partners, Dave Lewis and Dave Murphy, won, I believe, 97, 98, 99 for this, the co-op world championships for freestyle. Whammo did a commemorative disc for them, which was a paid disc. Like they got paid for this disc. I want you wow. to look at the packaging on the back. Oh, I can't wait. Because this to me captures your essence as a okay. person. Okay. But Dave Lewis said, I want you to read the, the top quote from okay. Dave Lewis out loud. <laughs> like, that's how much I love these old Frisbee players, whether it's disc golf, ultimate, like freestyle. They don't care about money. They like love what they're doing so much. I want you to read that quote out oh, loud. Oh, I, I happily will. I just had to get through it once because I don't know if I could read it cleanly <laughs> on the spot. Here we go. Dave Lewis. <clears throat> Pulling off a twisto juice to an Oliver pull to a triple spinning guy just really gets me fired up. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling off a twisto juice to an Oliver pull to a triple spinning guy just really gets me fired up. And you know what, Germ? That speaks to me. Yeah, it on many to me levels. Too. <laughs> First off, I know you love packaging. I know you love art. I yeah, know yeah, you love yeah. history. Yeah, yeah. This is a piece of history because yeah. now all the tour series discs are golf discs. Yeah. And it took you a while to get that first big time tour series disc. Mm -hmm. Will you unpackage Arthur's tour series disc and then talk to this me about the, here. Here the history we're, of we're yours? Taking... Sure, yeah. So starting playing uh, uh, disc golf in Charlotte, uh, we're really close to Rock Hill, South Carolina, a short 30 minute drive away. Um, ooh, nice, that thing's crisp. The Charlotte Disc Golf Club was like essentially all Innova. So when it came down to getting discs from like amateur events or just going to the local stores that sold anything, it was all Innova, which meant everything that I saw was Ken Climo or Barry Schultz, mm -hmm. right? Everything, uh, like all the great discs had either those two names on them. And so like, to me, that was like the ultimate goal is to maybe one day do so well at this thing that um, you could be recognized and honored with a, uh, a signature disc. Um, but you know, good luck getting these guys' names off the disc because they're the best in the world. I wanted to, you know, my, my very first goal in the sport, before I even started playing disc golf, like in tournaments, my very first goal, this is gonna sound crazy, 
and I haven't told many people this, and I definitely have never said this on camera before. <laughs> my very first goal in the sport, I didn't even know it existed, but I wanted to be in the Disc Golf Hall of Fame if it existed. Like, after three or four rounds of playing disc golf, I was like, this is it, bro. I am in. You said you wanted to be in the Hall of Fame? Disc Golf Hall of Fame. If there is one, I want it. That's what I wanted. And so, <laughs> my ambition was great from the start, and I didn't know. Like, how could I know? I didn't, I didn't know where I stacked up. I just <laughs> knew that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, when you do enough in the sport, and, and at the time, I'll, I'll, the only way that you got your name on a disc was winning a world title, which kind of at a certain point seemed a bit archaic. You get one tournament a year, and there's only like one or two guys that are winning this thing. Like, that's the only way I can get my name on a disc? Like, it doesn't seem very likely. Yeah. But then, you know, like they eventually, uh, oh. that was really good effort. They eventually kind of, uh, I think they opened the floodgates for signature discs going to different types of majors when the Tour Series program was introduced in, by Innova in 2015. And when they did that, they, they were seeing that these names, Paul Macbeth, Nate Sexton, so on and so forth, when their names were on a disc, these discs sold well. Mm -hmm. And so it was a catalyst. Like, you know, obviously you could say the same thing about uh, Ken Climo, but could you? Because he had the Champ Firebird. He had the Star Wraith. He had the KC Rock. He had the KC had AVR. Like, those are the best discs available. Of course they're going to sell. It's the best that you could possibly buy. Yeah. So how do we really know if a disc is going to sell with a name on it unless we put Paul Macbeth's name on a Mystere? Yeah, <laughs> Which exactly. Which they did, and it sold. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah. That really opened up in of his eyes as to like, okay, maybe we can put, uh, uh, maybe we can award these players this this grand gesture, this honor of putting their name um, on a disc for something other than a world title. And so they they started with putting Nate on the Excalibur, and then the next off season, I just said, hey, like, I really like the AVRX3. Like, I think I might like it more than anyone else in the world. <laughs> and I've won the US DGC. <laughs> Just like Nate, do you think maybe? And, and they called me back the next day and they said, you know, you asked for the right disc. Yeah. And the answer is yes. And so um, that's, uh, that's what happened. And, and, and when I got that call the next day after asking, I, uh, it, it's like this crazy thing because the, the difference that you get from a tour series with a signature is like night and day. I don't even know... <laughs> Like we're talking pennies to a dollar essentially in a, in a way. But I don't know if I've ever been more excited about any sort of news in disc golf than getting that call that day saying, your name's gonna be on your favorite disc. Did you, did you ever, like when you first started getting anything, like whether it was that disc, the Thunderbird, like more sponsors, did you ever feel extra pressure? Did it ever start to feel like, oh wow, now it's no longer just for me like, it's about all yeah. these other people now, too. Uh, uh, initially, no, actually. Initially, no, because I was very comfortable in my place in the sport, and I was still very determined. And I think before Jomez days, when I didn't have uh, a side income, disc golf was it, and I was very focused in on it. And so, like, when I went into my first year with Innova, I just came off of winning the USDGC, and um, I was ready to prove myself with a new brand. I don't think I started feeling pressure until the critics started talking about, you know, he's done and all that. And then I, I felt this pressure to shut them up because I was sick yeah. and tired of people saying that, you know, just because I hadn't won a tournament in, in a few months, like people are saying that he was a never was. Not even a has been, he was a never was. And it's like, dude, what do you mean? Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Like, how many, how many tour events and how many majors does a guy have to win before he's given some respect in this game? Like, I mean, I don't, I don't have to prove myself to the haters and the naysayers and all that. But it, it, it hurts seeing those kind of comments coming in through YouTube channels and stuff like that because it's like, dude, like, you clearly either don't know or, or I did something to really upset you a long time yeah. ago. And, uh, and I think that, you know, at a certain point, you start believing that you're not, you're not it anymore. And then at that point, you know, I think there is some extra pressure to, like, prove to yourself, like, dude, I can still throw the disc as far as I could when I was 28. And I'm 38 now. And I'm actually more accurate in many ways. My backhand's way better, my putt's more consistent. Yet my placement is down in the 30s because the competition's all gotten better. So what do you do? Well, well I think you just appreciate the, the opportunity that my career has brought me to be in this position where I can enjoy going on the road, I can still play tournaments and get my endorphins out that way. Yeah. 
And then I can also compete as much as I possibly can oh. when I can. And you know, just be happy with that. And if I if I if I like shock the world but not shock myself and I get top 10, or if I'm even in the mix of the tournament, then great. But if I'm not, like, guess what? I still have a, a, a really amazing job working with Jomez and with the Disc Golf Network. And, mm -hmm. like, that to me is, like, you know, we're, we're good. We've done it. Mm -hmm. Like, I've, I've, I've had such an amazing career, and I don't have to be a top 10 guy anymore. Yeah. As amazing as that feels and as, as, as much validation as that brings me in a way to say, like, hey, dude, watch out, Gannon. I still got you. Those days maybe have come and gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, but when you do, when you do put it all together for one tournament and you do beat those guys who are just whooping your tail all the other weeks. Feels good. Feels pretty good. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about me being into design. One of my things that I like to do in the off season is do graphic design, logos, so on and so forth. I just gotta get my creative juices out. So I got into 3D printing a couple years ago and um, Last year, I wanted to print out a disc, see if I could, and see how it fly. And I tried to get my AVRX3 as close as possible. And I came up with this mold here, and uh, it's pretty dang close. It's pretty dang close. The first one I printed was PLA, which is very stiff, very rigid. And on its maiden voyage, literally taking it off the plate, taking it to the course, this thing literally printed overnight, morning of, grab it, come out here. First flight from this tee pad to that basket, shot goes in, disc breaks on impact. <laughs> and there's a guy down there at the bottom of the hill, actually, at that basket. And he said, did you just ace? And I said, yeah. And he's like, I just aced that basket 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and then he's like, That's awesome. he looks up, he's like, is that big germ? And I'm like, yeah. And he like runs up the hill and there's this cool moment. And like, anyway, so I figured we'd uh, we end the segment Maybe we'll try to ace it again with this disc that won't break, hopefully. Go for it. Let's go, man. I did that one backhand. This thing's a little beefier, so I think I'm gonna go forehand. That is a beefy boy. Not even close. That is a beefy <laughs> boy. Germ. Yeah, hey. Thanks, bud. Bri. Dude, I'm so happy we finally made this happen. I'm glad we're doing it here in Charlotte. It feels right. You wanna do it again sometime? I would love to, man. Okay. We've talked about this before. There are bad days in disc golf. There are bad days in ultimate. I have not once yet had a bad day playing catch. I agree. It's the greatest Frisbee sport in the world as far as I'm concerned. Thanks Good for night. having me, man. Good night. Yeah, man. Unreal. Coming up next on Catch, the man, the myth, the legend, James Conrad joins me for a game of long toss and an in-depth discussion about juggling. We'll see you then. Moment of truth. You have such a beautiful sidearm, James. Are you ever gonna throw more driver sidearms like off the tee? <laughs>